keeping iron out, particularly off a root or a plant, so that the, uh, the, the, the soil is saturated with iron, the plant has the uh, root has the task of letting enough iron in and keeping most of the iron out. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay. So we have the paradox that we live in an iron-rich environment, and yet we have iron deficiency. We already heard that iron switches readily between the divalent and the trivalent form. It's highly reactive. Iron is toxic, and that is the reason why in the body it is never allowed to be free. It's always chaperoned, it's always attached to a protein because it's so toxic. Too much iron in the body is bad. We have the body has no excretory mechanism, and that is the reason why all regulation of the body iron content occurs at the absorption level. And that's it, it, the absorption is very tightly regulated because once the iron is in, there's no way of getting rid of it. I show you this to tell you uh, about the newborn baby the four-month-old baby and the 12-month-old baby. When the baby is born, it contains about 250 milligrams of iron. Most of it is in hemoglobin, as it is in the rest of the, for the rest of the life. But a substantial amount is present as storage iron. We call that the birth iron endowment. And that, of course, the hemoglobin is not fixed, it can be variable, but the birth, the storage iron, is quite variable. I will show you the same graph again when we talk about how much iron the baby needs to absorb, to acquire, in order to reach from birth to the first birthday. But before we do that, I'll tell you a little bit more about closely regulated absorption. You already heard that. Uh, the percentage absorption is low if the body stores are full. The heme iron is readily absorbed by a special mechanism that is separate from the non-heme iron mechanism. And the, the non-heme iron is subject to inhibition by phytate, tannins, and stimulation such as by, by, by uh, ascorbic acid. Whereas the, well, we all have that. So the heme iron is the good iron that is not, su not subject to inhibition. Here is a schematic drawing of heme iron, and this is the mucosal surface, is a villi. It is absorbed highly efficiently and no inhibition, whereas non-heme iron is enhanced by certain sugars, vitamin C, and by meat. Meat in itself enhances the absorption of non-heme iron from other sources. And here are the inhibitors, phytates, calcium, phosphorus, and fiber. Um, a close-up view, which is a uh, similar one that you always saw before, Professor Markov. The iron is absorbed by the divalent metal transport of one. It's this one here, which is also transports copper and calcium, and therefore the competitive inhibition. The heme iron has a separate transporter, and there is probably another separate transporter that transports uh, iron attached to lactoferrin. Inside the cell, the, trans the iron is transported to the uh, <clears throat> basolateral surface uh, or membrane, and there it has to be extruded from the cell, and that molecule is called ferroportin. FPN stands for ferroportin. Iron can attach itself to transfer and transport it in the, in the blood. So, hepcidin, a new molecule that we've only known for about 18, 20 years. It incapacitates the ferroportin and thereby prevents iron from being extruded from the intestinal absorptive cells and therefore in inhibits uh, uh, absorption. The, here is the ferroportin schematically shown. Um, that's what it uh, ferroportin is at the basal lateral membrane and also in, uh, in uh, macrophages. The uh, hepcidin is formed in, in the hepatocytes. And it is formed when the hepatocytes, when the, uh, the storage is, iron storage sites are full. Then hepcidin is formed, it travels to the ferroportin and inhibits the ferroportin that enhances its degradation and therefore inhibits, uh, uh, prevents its function and the absorption of iron. 
<coughs> no? So, we have iron deficiency when there is not enough iron in the body to carry out the functions. Who is at the greatest risk of iron deficiency? It's individuals who have high needs because of rapid growth. That includes the premature infant, the young infant, and the pregnant woman who has high needs because the fetus takes iron away. The fetus is a very effective parasite. Whether the mother has an iron available or not, the fetus takes iron. And uh, then there are certain, certain groups of, of uh, subjects who have high losses that includes adolescent <coughs> girls. The manifestations include the hematologic system, you all know the anemia and the microcytosis. Uh, so circulating ferritin is a measure of iron stores. It's a direct, a direct proportion to the size of the iron stores. The only problem is that it can be falsely increased by an infection, by any acute reaction. And that's why uh, ferritin can be falsely high, but it can never be falsely low. If you have a low ferritin, it means it, it, this is the iron stores are low. I have illustrated here the brain. Because that is clinically solid. If a one-year-old child has iron deficiency uh, that affects the brain, that we cannot recognize clinically. Maybe the baby that Professor Mokhtar showed, showed evidence being solved. But by and large, there are no specific signs that we can use to identify when there is not enough iron available for the brain. And that's a very big problem because we have to guess we can measure it in the blood, but we cannot measure it in the brain, and we cannot measure or recognize effects of inadequate amount of iron for the brain. Uh, this is how I prefer to define uh, iron deficiency. Decreased stores when the ferritin is less is 12 to 20, less than 20 to 30. Iron deficiency when serum ferritin is less than 12. These other things uh, how helpful, as has been mentioned. I don't use them in my research. I, I have, uh, I use ferritin. And when ferritin is low, less than 12, plus if there is anemia, then it is severe iron deficiency. And uh, because anemia is the last thing, uh, hemoglobin synthesis, the last thing to follow. Hemoglobin seems to have some preference over available iron. And when hemoglobin is low, the iron deficiency is really severe. That is why iron, iron deficiency anemia is a severe advanced form of iron deficiency. It's not to be taken lightly. Not all anemia, of course, is, is due to iron deficiency. As was mentioned earlier, I think in some, some circumstances up to 50% can be due to other causes. But if it is iron deficiency, if the ferritin is low and the hemoglobin is low, it is serious, severe iron deficiency. So, I, I, I spent a few minutes to talk to you about iron deficiency in the brain because it is a, an issue where there are very big differences of, of opinion. I'll give you my opinion. I'll tell you, I'm telling you that in animal models, we know all these things to happen. Iron deficiency affects myelination, that is a decrease in myelin formation, then uh, formation of dendrites, synaptogenesis, neurotransmitters. Reversibility depends on the severity, timing, and duration of iron deficiency. Some of these effects are not reversible, and we have to remember that. If the young infant is iron deficient, the effects may not be reversible. Uh, we have these human studies. Uh, comparisons of iron deficient with non-iron deficient subjects of various ages. In 16 studies, all have shown some decrease of some function of neurocognitive function, motor development, etc. In treatment studies, item 2, many, but not all, effects of deficiency persist despite treatment. In nine studies, subjects who had an iron deficiency anemia early had some decreased functioning on follow-up. And then finally, iron supplementation improved motor development, improved social emotional development. We have all this evidence. And it all together 
to me, is convincing that iron deficiency has effects on the central nervous system, some of which are persistent, that is, they are permanent. A review of the, of the, of the data by this uh, respectable group, Grantham, McGregor, and Annie, came to the conclusion that on the question of whether iron deficiency early in life causes, and the emphasis is mine, whether it causes permanent deficits in cognition, the verdict is that although most of the criteria for causality are satisfied, a causal connection has not been established beyond doubt. And the reason for that is that there has not been a prospective randomized trial where one group of infants or ch children were made iron deficient, another was not made iron deficient by giving iron and then being followed. This experiment will never be done, so we will never have what the evidence-based gurus consider solid evidence. To me, the evidence that I described to you is sufficient to believe that iron causes permanent, that iron deficiency causes permanent <coughs> effects on the brain, and it gives me the mandate to do everything possible to prevent infants and young children from being iron deficient. The infant. I have already mentioned that the infant has high iron needs, and I'll talk more about this. The typical diet of the infant, the typical diet is breast milk or fruits, cereals, uh, are low in iron. The, the challenge is to meet the baby's iron needs despite the typically low iron content. What protects the infants, right? What protects the infants in the first four to six months is the brain birth iron endowment. Fortunately, the baby gathers enough iron from the mother to last for the four, for four to six months. <clears throat> and that's this, 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 this component here, storage iron. But that is highly variable. <clears throat> and um, to go from the total iron content of, at birth, which is around 250 milligrams, we have very good chemical analysis. <clears throat> To a typical one-year-old one infant, uh, we need to increase by about 170 milligrams. Now, it could be a one-year-old could have less storage iron, maybe only 20, and then this would be a four, 390. But it's still a large increase, a large increase that occurs mostly from four months on, because until four months, most babies are exclusively breastfed. And even though the breast milk iron content is low, it is enough to replace ongoing losses. So at four months, as assumed in this graph here, this, uh, the baby's iron content is the same as at birth. The distribution is somewhat different, less storage, more hemoglobin. But until four months, no change in net iron status. <clears throat> but from four months to 12 months, there has to be a great increase. And that increase we can calculate in various ways. The increase, the total increase, is about 170 milligrams. We have inevitable losses, adds up to 260. Uh, that gives us 0.72 milligrams per day for the average, for, on average for the first year's life. And this is absorbed iron. This is absorbed iron. And as we have done, mentioned several times, the, the percent of iron, of dietary iron that, that is absorbed, can be highly variable. Uh, we, we have to make assumptions, we can't, it's very difficult to measure. But absorbed iron has to be 0.72, or if we start at five months after the baby has been on the same iron for, for the first four months, then it is 1.06 milligrams. One milligram per day of absorbed iron. Now, <coughs> the birth iron endowment, which I have now mentioned several times, it is mostly storage iron, also some hemoglobin iron, because the baby is born with a higher hemoglobin concentration than the baby has a few weeks later. But here is a graph of the iron endowment shown as plasma ferritin from one month. This is from one of my studies. At one month, uh, the ferritin has this appearance. It goes from about 50 to about 700. And that huge range of storage iron, ferritin, <coughs> is not caused by the mother's iron status. It's, this is totally independent. 
only in very severe iron deficiency, none of my mothers had severe iron deficiency, <coughs> is the plasma, is the iron endowment affected of the baby. So this is all intrinsic variation. I, we don't know the causes. I suspect strongly it is genetic. And also because if you look, or I, I can't, uh, this we can see, but the, the iron tracks from one month to 12 months and even up to 18 months, it tracks. So there's a, uh, a ferritin that is high and one age is always high, a ferritin that's low and one age is always low. <coughs> the important thing of this is that you don't know whether the baby is born with a ferritin of 500 or with a ferritin of 100. You don't know that unless you look. And I, I think you should look. But we don't know that the baby that is born with a ferritin of 100 can be iron deficient by three months or by four months. And you don't know it. And then you have to act as if you, <coughs> as if this could be. So this the important message here is the iron endowment is highly variable and its size determines when the baby runs out of iron. The baby starts with 500, the baby may well be okay all the way out to 9 months or 10 months without getting any additional iron. If the baby starts at 100, he may need additional iron at 4 months or even earlier. I've done three studies that I show you the results of two, uh, just uh, to tell you what, uh, what, the, what, what we find. This is the ferritin again, you see it starts high, on average of one month is about 300. In this case, we gave iron from one month to five and a half months, because at the time we did this study, that was a, a common recommendation. Give iron early while the mother listens to you, and that will last the baby for the rest of the first year of life. Well, that turned out to be not true. Uh, it did help the baby while we were giving the iron supplement, but after we stopped the iron supplement here, uh, there was no effect. You can see there's not a lasting effect. So it's no point, there's no point in giving iron early while the baby has, has already, uh, still has full iron skills. So giving iron early is, is obviously useless. Uh, here in this study we had three groups, one that got nothing, one that got a medicinal iron, one that got a similar amount of iron, but from a, from a jar of cereal food combination that's wet packed and contains ferrosulfate. The two iron supplementing uh, groups did not differ. The control group was significantly lower. You see here, this is the period of iron intervention. Now, uh, in, from this study and from the third study, uh, here again is again the, from the control, the control subjects, the iron, the ferritin, and you see the same decrease that I showed you. Here you see occasional blips, like here, here. These are situations where the baby was obviously ill, and the ferritin was increased. And we have statistically treated this. We had a rule when the, when the ferritin was two and a half, twice higher than the adjacent ferritin, and we ignored it in our analysis. But you see, this is a typical thing. There may be a case here where a ferritin is, is increased due to an infection. In these three studies, I counted the number of babies who had severe iron deficiency, that is iron deficiency anemia, before six months. And here are the numbers. The total were 8 out of 286 babies for a percentage of 2.8 percent. And all, all these babies had low ferritins, and I can define that for you if you wish, but they all had low ferritins at one month, which tells me that these babies can be identified early in life at one month or two months. Severe iron deficiency among breastfed infants has been reported. This is, these are the reports. We are just one late addition, but it has been reported from several countries, including the United States. In breastfed babies, because you always hear, well, the breastfed baby is protected from iron. The breastfed baby, breastfed iron is so well absorbed, and the baby has the iron endowment. It is largely true, but it's not true for all babies. Some, 2 to 3% of babies are at risk of iron deficiency when they are fully breastfed. Now, uh, the issue of growth in breastfed babies who receive iron supplementation has received a fair amount of attention because people have advocated this shows uh, that this iron supplementation has adverse effects. In all these four studies here, it was seen that small but significant effects on growth were reported in iron replete infants only. 
In this study by Dewey, it was seen only in Sweden where babies were iron replete, not in Honduras. In India and Tanzania and Indonesia, the whole group didn't show the effect, but the iron replete babies showed a small but significant effect of, on growth from iron supplementation, medicinal iron. Here is what we found in this study, lab study that I just showed you. The medicinal iron group had a weight gain from, from four to nine months of 12.2 grams per day, which was significantly lower than the control group or the serial group. The same was true for, for, for length gain, significantly low. Because of this mild growth effect, and that nobody knows the mechanism for, nobody can say this is mild. So. But because of that, there is substantial opposition to the use of medicinal iron in breastfed babies. And that's certainly true in the United States, it's certainly true in Europe. It's largely because of this, and, and secondarily because of what people think iron does to the microbiome. And maybe iron is saturating lactoferrin and it makes it ineffective. There is substantial opposition to giving iron to breastfed babies that are not uh, known to be iron deficient. So, here we are, the first six months. The source of iron is largely the iron endowment, but it just may not be, it's not enough for all babies for the first six months. We just have to remember that. In the second six months, it's the source of iron has to be the diet because human milk does not provide enough to make that increase from that I just showed you that amounts to about 150, 170 milligrams in about eight months. Okay. So breast milk iron, uh, just a, a, a short summary, the breast milk iron content is low. It is not apparently designed to provide iron to the baby because the baby got the iron before birth. The breast milk iron is highly bioavailable, I'm sorry. Uh, and the breastfeed infant absorbs on average 1.13, which is a tiny amount compared to what the baby needs. The inevitable loss is 0 0.2, so the breast milk barely replaces the inevitable loss. But an important factor is that breast milk enhances the absorption of other dietary iron, that is non-heme iron. That's an important factor because while the baby's receiving complementary foods, the baby's receiving breast milk, and we, we can help on that to enhance the absorption. But the foods the baby receives are very low in iron. This is a listing of commercially available uh, uh, foods for infants in the United States. They are all low except if they contain meat. You see this number here, 1.7? This is a meat-containing variety that contains a substantial amount of iron. The cereal food combination that come in a jar uh, contain this much iron. This is ferrous sulfate, highly available. But overall, the use of these charred cereals is not very high. What is mostly used is dry cereals that come in a box, are cheap, enough, but are fortified with iron. But the fortification iron is electrolytic iron of very, very low bioavailability. We have no studies that prove that feeding the dry cereals is really capable of preventing iron deficiency, although such a study could be done. But that is that is what we do in the United States. We tell the mothers, give the baby iron fortified cereal. And we think and we hope that that will prevent iron deficiency. Uh, here's some other more numbers about the iron content of meats. Beef is higher than chicken. Here is your spinach, very high in iron, but almost surely not bioavailable. Egg yolk is a good source of iron, and uh, that's sometimes, sometimes not, not appreciated. Um, so, meat is a source of iron for infants and young children. Meat is a rich source of iron and has been advocated uh, many times as a source of iron that we should, that we should advocate. Iron is present as heme iron, which is well shook and not inhibited by phyte. Many authorities think that meat is a good complementary food, but use of meat is not yet supported by studies showing its effectiveness. I told you I think that's next. It's only about this big study that was published under the name of uh, 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 Nancy Krebs, where they gave meat versus cereal, and the cereal was fortified with, with iron, zinc, copper, selenium, magnesium, from, from six, 
or is it from 6 to 12 to 18 months? With the idea that the meat, as I told you earlier, would improve stunting, which it turned out it didn't. And with the idea that the meat would be at least as good as the iron fortified cereal in preventing iron deficiency. What did they find? Here are the iron status. Ferritin, this is at 18 months. Ferritin, 27.6 in the meat group, 38.2 in the cereal group. Significantly higher in the cereal group. Uh, transferrin receptor, which it goes up in iron deficiency, 13.7 higher than 12.1 in the cereal group. So in this study, the cereal fortified with iron and zinc, etc., proved to be more effective than meat. As a, as a source of iron and therefore as a prevention of iron deficiency. Very disappointing for those of us who think that meat should be, should be shown, but it hasn't been shown. There was another study by Nancy Krebs which also didn't show it. So, um, should we stop recommending meat? No, I'm not prepared. I'm still recommending meat until somebody, hopefully somebody does a good study that proves that it is effective. So, uh, breastfed infants. What do our uh, uh, official aid, uh, authorities recommend? Dr. Greer, uh, who will speak next, uh, and Dr. Baker uh, edited or, or uh, authored this recommendation for breastfed infants start iron supplements at four months. That is medicinal iron. Uh, that means regardless of you don't look at the iron status, we give all babies. Uh, one milligram per kilogram, or, or seven milligrams, as it turns out. Um, and s continue this supplementation until iron-containing complementary foods have been introduced. And the iron-containing complementary foods are foods containing meat or fortified cereals. Those are basically the iron-containing foods that mount them up. Between six and 12 months, the iron intake should be 11 milligrams per day. And then they recommend hemoglobin screening at 12 months in determination of risk factors for iron deficient iron deficiency. And I don't know what this is supposed to accomplish. But I need to tell you that this recommendation has met with considerable opposition. The breastfeeding community says, why give iron to babies when they have still have iron stores? And studies that tells them, tell us what, what the prevalence of iron deficiency is so we can we can, uh, uh, we can only guess. It's unknown to what extent the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics is being followed. I personally, and this is now my personal opinion, don't mis mistake that for, for anything we do. I think, I think we should look, we should screen babies early in life, and that would apply to you too, early in life, those who have low iron stores, I think we should treat with medicinal iron. The rest of the babies are fine. They have enough iron from the mother that will last them until the complementary foods are provide enough iron. But those who are low in iron, I think we should treat early. Okay, the formula fed infant. I need to tell you a little bit about cow milk. The formula fed infant doesn't have iron deficiency. That's why for the longest time we didn't know much about iron deficiency because all infants were formula fed and all formulas contained iron. Uh, the <coughs> cow milk used to be fed uh, in the United States. When I first moved to the United States, it was typical for babies to receive uh, something like a, a formula, uh, an operated milk formula, and then to switch to be switched to cow milk, a three month performance. That was very, very common. Reports of iron deficiency in babies receiving cow's milk came out, you see here, and this is not a complete list, but I, uh, it is certainly a representative list of studies that have shown that babies who receive cow's milk are prone to iron deficiency. No question about it. Uh, one recent study that I show you in more detail is from, from, from Iceland. They have a very healthy population. They looked at 94 randomly selected healthy children at two years and found that 9% were iron deficient. 1.4% had iron deficiency anemia at two years. And the consumption of cow milk was strongly negatively associated with all indicators of iron status. 
I show you here a breakdown of the two-year-olds, those who receive less than 500 milliliters and those who receive more than 500 milliliters per day. And you can see the iron status of those who receive more than 500 milliliters. The hemoglobin didn't reach the distance significant, but it was lower. The semiferritin was lower, the MCG was lower, the RDW was higher, and iron deficient classification were five children. So, there's no question that cow milk produces iron deficiency in a dose-dependent manner. More cow milk, the more cow milk, the more likely the baby is to be iron deficient. More, how does cow milk do that? The uh, cow milk is low in iron content, just as low as human milk. And there is a cult intestinal blood loss. We don't know what exactly that contributes, but we also know that, the, that iron, milk contains inhibitors of iron absorption. I'll tell you a little bit more about these things. This intestinal blood, here is the common blood uh, iron content, 0.4, just like human milk. Um, uh, in the 1960s, there was, it was discovered that some babies lost a fair amount of blood in the stool and could become iron deficient. We then did studies looking at healthy, unselected infants and found the following. Uh, this is in the study of unselected babies who receive cow milk, liquid pasteurized cow milk, starting at, a, a, at five, a five months of age. And uh, we measured the stool hemoglobin concentration. As you can see here, there was a significant increase and it stayed up for as long as the cow milk was fed. With a huge variation, you can see the error bars, and one infant in that study became iron deficient with anemia within one month. So it can, it can have a wider range. Uh, but we studied older infants, and it turns out that the older the infant becomes, the less, the less risk is that response to, to uh, for cold blood loss, and at one year of age, it is basically disappeared. Um, the, the upshot of all this was, okay, now here, more mechanism. Cow milk contains high concentrations of two potent inhibitors that have already mentioned here, casein and calcium. And that, we think, is probably the main mechanism by which cow milk causes iron In 1992, our academy recommended that uh, whole cow milk should not be used for the first year of life. This was widely followed, and cow milk has disappeared in the first year of life. You see an occasional baby that receives cow milk at 10 months, but not at two months and three months as we used to have. Um, so, we can say cow milk should not be fed in the first year of life, and in the second year of life, cow milk intake should be limited to 500 milliliters uh, per day or less. Okay, what can be done? Given that we do not look at the iron status in a timely manner, and given so further that there is wide opposition to the use of medicinal iron, the pediatrician can advise the mother to feed iron containing foods. And these would be country specific. In the United States, there would be meat containing foods and iron fortified cereals. And tell the mother to do that regularly and tell her to avoid cow. It's as simple as that, but that's what we can do. Uh, if you want to measure ferritin at one month or two months, then you would know which baby is low and is at risk of iron deficiency. Thank you.